Hey, you're listening to the Mr. Bill podcast. Hey, you're listening to the Mr. Bill podcast. Hey, you are listening to the Mr. Bill podcast. Hey, you're 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 listening to the Mr. Bill podcast. I can see through you. See your... <laughs> is that test, test, test? Is that not Nickelback? Oh yeah, it might be Nickelback. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sweet. Um, we can leave that in, and we can edit it, whatever. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> All right, man. Well, welcome to episode five of the Mister Bill podcast. Yes, happy so, to be here. Um, yeah, the first one I think I explained was with uh, Andrew Huang. Second one was with Ankle Pants. Third one was with Mercy. Fourth one was with Vibe Squad. So wow. it's number five. <laughs> really want to hear that ankle pants one. The ankle pants one was sick. Hold on, I need to shut Discord off. What's up, Discord? Yeah, the ankle pants one was sick. We mostly talked about like his setup because his whole set basically, like his live set basically runs out of max MSP. Oh my gosh. And uh, everything on his body is like he 3D printed himself. So it's like this whole proprietary system on his body that he just like kind of uses to control the computer so he can uh so it's like tracking his movements like yeah so he has an accelerometer on his back and oh, like geez. as he moves around and shit like mainly the main thing that i could tell it was controlling was a filter <laughs> but like yeah it's like his whole body is the instrument and um he has like a lot of ac accelerometers and stuff in like he has a uh, pressure sensors in his shoes so when he like walks and stuff like that it like you know creates kind of you know all sorts of stuff like when he when he started his set at the black box he like emerged from like the green room there and he started like walking really slowly and through the sound system there was these big like boom boom oh man boom, while he was walking out and it just looked like so theatrical and crazy and cool oh that's awesome yes yeah, so he does a lot of shit like that which is kind of cool yeah that sets the bar for like effort put into a show i'm i'm just um yeah, you know, I I love I love all of the adornments he <laughs> has at his shows, but like I imagine that you know seeing it with the 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 Mac stuff is just another level. It's crazy, yeah. Especially like looking at his uh, computer when he's playing is just like fucking lights flashing in Max and shit. And you're like, <laughs> what the fuck is going on over there? You know, that's that's how that's how it felt when I first used Max. It was like. You're not cool unless your your set looks like a whole bunch of black spaghetti. Yeah, you know yeah, yeah. you you have to have the <laughs> the sickest and most hard to understand max patch, yeah. and then you are a computer god. Yeah, yeah. Which um actually, if you talk to programmers, uh, is not the case. If you <laughs> if you <laughs> if you talk to programmers, well, it's, like, it's much easier to keep it neat these days. Now it's it's it, uh, it is, and also like um all the programming people I've talked to recently through proxy of um, meeting Yarn. Have all been like, yeah, it's just you know way more abstract to do it in nodes and way easier to just like do it in lines and just have this like hierarchy system where you kind of like set a set of rules in the top lines of code and then the bottom lines of code underneath that start to just like reference those top lines and say like, all right, we set you know a for instance to to equal this formula. So now when I later reference it down here in the code, it like knows to just reference that formula and stuff. Whereas with Max, that would look way more crazy. For starters, the formula would be like a set of nodes all connected to each other. Yeah. And then you'd have to like somehow fucking patch that shit back <laughs> into itself. Whereas like, you know, in, in code, it's like two lines of code. Yeah. Well, I've, I've been open Max for a while, to be honest. Uh, so Yeah, I don't fuck with it much. but um, It's not like riding a bike. No. <laughs> you, you don't just learn max and then later on come back and be like well what's up max my old friend <laughs> it's like a language you know i guess where you have to be speaking it really often but anyway um good thing is that i i know a lot of really good people at max so or, or uh, that know max so if you have a need so if i made. ever have a really big need i could go to like wolg or something like that he's such a mad scientist and yeah, yeah. if you got an idea he can just cook it up yeah. So yeah, that's um something we could talk about as well as your actual live setup. So you do like a pretty crazy visual live show with Zebla. Um are you, are you using much Mac stuff in that? Uh we are not, but our the technology we use to do Zebla and Canty experience has evolved over the gosh, 10 years that we've been doing it. 
when we started off, Zebler was just using Archaos, and I was on Ableton 4. And, uh, cheers. And, uh, we would basically just try to hit play at the same time, and that's how we would synchronize. Oh, wow. So, like, um, you would, like, play a track, and he would be next to you on stage, and then he, he would... Uh, play a video at the same time, the which same was time. janky. Yeah, that's super janky. And other times, um, we would switch off on who's doing the audio. Like, he would play a video that would take over the audio, mm -hmm. and then I would go back and take, t take it over. And, you know, we started with two computers, and then eventually um, we made a friend who uh, offered to actually write us our own software. And he said, Zebler, oh. what do you need? And Zebler's like, all right, I want to be able to actually play videos from a hard drive um, in the same way you would play like DVDs on like a CDJ, like a DVDJ. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, that didn't exist. If you right. wa if you wanted to use essentially... like a DJ controller yeah, yeah. and just spin tracks off your hard drives, like video tracks, yeah. in HD, you can do it. Mm. Uh, you could only do it in SD, and that was that was janky on its own. You know, that was yeah, Max, yeah. and I think the Serato v VJ was just SD. But we were doing that full three screen uh, across really wide resolution, and so we ha we got custom software made so we could play our tracks just like a, a DJ, and we had this DJ kind of controller, and it was called the Zebler Tron, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was great because it also connected to. Um, DMX lighting, and uh, we took it on tour with uh, Spangl and Iodo, and Zebler did their visuals, and we also opened for them um, back in 2011 or so. And it was great because we could send data to all of the lights they had on stage. It was it was it was really ideal, other than the moments where it failed. Mm -hmm. And then <laughs> there's only one guy that knows what's going on, and we'd have to like wake him <laughs> up at like three o'clock in the morning. Oh, poor Chris. And uh, <laughs> I'd say, it's glitching out in this way. Um, and But uh, shortly after that, though, finally, um, you could finally run Resolume and Ableton on the same computer. At first, it was two computers, and you could get them to talk to each other. So we were doing that for a while. And then finally, you could do it on one computer. And since since we finally got like Ableton and Resolume talking to each other openly and easily and cleanly that's opened so many um so many doors in the last couple of years and we've kind of stuck with that format right so your setup currently is just one computer and you run resolume and ableton on one computer yes and in addition to that we have a script running um it's it's called a pixel pusher okay and uh any visuals that we're doing um we send pixel map data to these leds that are embedded in the ziggurat Oh, like the front bit of the stage, right? Yeah, so, yeah, so it the, has the infinity To explain moves. to people um, what your stage looks like, it's basically you and Zebler on stage, a table behind you guys is like this big uh, shape, which I could only describe as like um, sort of wings, I guess. It looks like some wings. Yeah, they're wings attached to a horned triangle. Yep, yep. <laughs> wings attached to a horned triangle. <laughs> and then uh, on the front of the stage, you have like a, what is, an infinity mirror with LEDs in it. Yeah, the, the, the front of the stage kind of completes the triangle. It, it kind of fans out like the bottom half of a triangle. So when you look at the front and then look at the back, it's, it's kind of like this single unit. And um, instead of that being projection surface, it has these LEDs in it. And the LEDs are making um, use of whatever colors that we're playing in our visuals. So if we got, you know, blue and purple visuals going by, the LEDs are mimicking them. They're of course blue on, a, and purple. on a single pixel kind of outlining the 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 shape. It's really magical when it's in the zone. I mean, I just I wish I was in my own audience more to see what it looked like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it looks really good. I mean, all the shows that I've seen of you guys, it, it looks really sick. And the actually um I did a tour sort of based off uh based off your your setup actually. It was um in 2016 I did a visual tour and I really liked the idea um of backlit projection, like a uh, rear projection, oh, yeah. because it's so much better than front projection. Because if you do front projection, it looks so messy. Because like then a bunch of the projection just ends up on your body and on your fucking gear. Whereas if you do it from the back, um, you just turn into a silhouette. Yeah, and it looks so much cooler, man. Yeah, yeah, and also you know front projection. You never know where the projection is gonna go. Is it going to be in front of house yeah, or yeah. attached to the ceiling? Yeah, exactly. If you're doing it from the front, it's kind of like, yeah, where do you hang? Like every venue is a logistical nightmare and <laughs> you have to come in at like 4 p.m. or even earlier, 2 p.m. And, and 
say to the venue manager, hey, I'm going to uh, hang a projector right here. And they're like, no, you're fucking not. <laughs> no, that is against fire code. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No one's going to be able to escape if the projector's right there. <laughs> yeah, cool. Well, so you've been doing this for um, like the, the Zebler and Conti experience thing has been evolving then over what, like 10 years? Or? Yeah, gosh, we're getting old. <laughs> I mean, that's the same as the Mr. Bill thing. It's been about 12 years now. Yeah, um, we we first started actually probably in I want to say 2008, so that's 11 years. Yeah, same. but when we started, it was really different. I I had just finished going to college at Berkeley College of Music, and um, I I was really more into making like glitch, square pusher, Aphex Twin, but also like, you know, my my only in uh, in lane into dance music was breakcore. You oh wow. okay. So like I'm um, Aaron Spector. Do you know him? I love Aaron Spector. Yeah, he did a remix for Electricado, um, like a year. The drum core remix? Yep. Yes, yes, I know that one. Yeah, um, you, you were on that release. I'm too. a I'm a fan. Yeah. I, when I saw drum core was on there, I was I was <laughs> geeking. Yeah, he's awesome. I love that guy. <laughs> um uh so yeah, yeah, I was I, I kind of got into it the same way as well a little bit. Like um for for me, electronic music has started with Psytrance, actually. Oh wow. And then it went from Psytrance to Breakcore, which and when I say breakcore I mean like um Aphex and Square Pusher and Venetian yeah. Snares pretty much. And then um there was like a big breakcore scene in Sydney that I got into and then after that kind of got into like the, Oh that's so awesome. When when was your breakcore scene? Was that like two thousand eight? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. yeah. Um, and actually, during that time, I saw Aaron play uh, a show in Sydney. And also, that same year, I think it was 2008, it might have been earlier, even 2006 or something like that, I saw E1 and Spore play a show oh, in Sydney shit. to like 100 people. Oh, and man. I also saw Noisier and Face play a show in that same venue to also like 100 people. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, I electronic dude. Score. This is one thing I really fucking think is crazy is like in the last 10 years since I got into and since you got into electronic music as well, it's just blown up so much to the point now where it's like, um, I mean, I don't know if you experienced this, but sometimes I'll see somebody get like uber successful and I'll get like sort of like a little bit jealous, but then I'll remember, I'll be like, this behooves me for this to happen. Like, this is good because it means like the whole thing just gets fucking bigger and then you know, 10 years ago, the best of the best noisier and f shit were playing to like a hundred people. It's like now the, anyone can play to a hundred people. It's cause it's just that fucking big. I, I think that, um, electronic music, it levels the playing field a lot in the world. You know, um, it is, a, the laptop is the new folk instrument of yeah, right yeah, now, yeah. <laughs> you know, because right now everybody has a laptop and if you want to use it to express yourself, you can start out fairly freely and then just get better and better at it. And uh, you can make a Grammy winning album on a laptop, you know? And even if that's not your goal to do like a Grammy or something, I, I just love that that someone who, like myself, I'm actually, got, I have terrible motor skills. <laughs> I started by playing guitar and I was not good at it. I mean, I can still, I can bang out some riffs, but you know, I got kind of small fingers. It took me a long time to like learn how to tie my shoes. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to admit. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I still had a lot of musical ideas in my head. And uh, I think that, you know, the fact that you can just sit and meditate in front of a keyboard for a while and all of a sudden a really cool track can come out, that is that is so liberating for so many people like myself and like anyone that can that can pick up a laptop can can get involved and yeah if you just like touch the computer in the right ways and, the, and you, if you just like do the right button combo over a long enough period of time you can make a grammy winning album yes it's just like if i if i touch my phone in all the right places a pizza will come to my door <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> <laughs> on an abstract level <laughs> You, you touch the keyboard in the right way and vibrations appear yeah, in one yeah. way or another <laughs> and those get repeated enough and all of a sudden you have a career. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> um, yeah, cool. So you were saying you went to Berkeley? That's pretty cool. Yeah, um, I went to Berkeley from 2003 to 2007. Nice. I feel like everyone I know who came from Berkeley is like such a fucking talented person now. Like uh, Jade Cicada, he's, he went there. He's super talented. Yeah. Um, who else do I know that went there? I mean, obviously you went there. Um, oh, there's a guy on Beleagle Beats who went there and he just finished and started working at Isotope in Boston. Oh, what's, what's his name? Uh, Will Campbell. He's uh, He produces under the name Cloud Cluster. He just put an EP out on Beleagle Beats. Awesome. <clears throat> yeah, it's really sick. Um, who else do I know? I mean, everyone I met really at Berkeley, Valencia, who who uh, came from Boston, 
were fucking awesome and really talented musicians and stuff. Oh uh, yeah, so we should talk about that. So you you went from uh, be living in Boston or you know, studying in Boston, doing Berkeley there, to then getting a job and moving to Spain, and then you developed the sound design program at the master's level for Berkeley in Valencia. Yes, um, I well when I was a student at Berkeley Boston, I was one of the um, first people that gave a uh, workshop and that gives forums and talks about Ableton Live. I was an enthusiast. I was right, like okay. a nerd. Yeah. And I got into it before it was taken seriously as a music creation program. Mm -hmm. And I would have kind of like meetups. And this was just kind of the extra activity that I did while I was studying at Berkeley. Because I just, you know, it's it's such a, it's it's social software, you know, it's it's software where people kind of share their tricks and uh, and and you know can try things really fast. Anyway, finally, when Ableton Live started getting more popular, um, they started popping up user groups everywhere, and um, my talks had kind of caught the attention of um, the folks at Ableton, and they asked me to do the Boston user group. So I did that for a while, and then in around 2013, I. Um, uh, I, uh, some friends of mine opened up a school called Maven in uh, Cambridge. And I, I, at the time I was doing like sound design, I was trying to release some records, but it was really month to month, you know, and it was like January. And they were like, will you, you know, design a uh, class about how to use Ableton Live and produce? And so I said, yeah. And I designed it and I taught it and I only taught it for about three or four months until I got a phone call from uh, Stephen Weber at Berkeley Valencia who said, hey, we are opening a new college in Valencia. Um, I heard that you've been teaching Ableton, that you've been writing classes. And I said, yeah, but I'm really new to it, but I've been talking about it for a long time. I love talking about it. It's what I'm thinking about all day. You know, when I talk about electronic music, I feel like I'm just sharing thoughts I would be having otherwise. <laughs> yeah, totally. so it's actually a really, really fun job for me because I'm just so enthusiastic about it and I'm, it's where my thoughts and heart resides. So he asked me to come over and give a workshop, and I went over and uh, and and after giving like two workshops, they said that they're basically looking for someone to help them develop the electronic music part of the new master's degree in music production technology and innovation. And uh, so I got the job, and I I was uh, there teaching the first class. It's only twenty students, and um, I wrote a class first about kind of the intro to electronic music. Um, and basically the idea was um, the whole class was an excuse to work on on creative endeavors while learning the software. So even if you knew the software, the projects, I'm proud to say, uh, even if you know the software, the projects are engaging and really fun and are a really good excuse to like get the creative juices going. And by the end, the idea is for people to be able to be at least competent with not only using Ableton, but also like writing and talking about creative things and making interesting uh, writing decisions. You know, I wanted it to be about not just not just the technology, but the result. You know. Yeah, I mean, I got into tutorials the exact same way as this. I, was, I, I would explain it the same way. I was just sharing thoughts that I would otherwise be having anyway, and like. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, I think a lot of tutorials, like I, I think um, mine included, are sort of yeah, sort of more or less based on the technical side of things. Like just how do you click a few buttons to get this crazy result rather than be like, how do you piece it all together to create a, an interesting end result? But that's why I started the Artemis to build is, is kind of like that. It's just like, hey, you've like watched all my tutorials. You know how to do all the technical shit. Now like watch me just do this shit for like 14 hours straight and you can see exactly how a tune is made. Right, yeah. Like I, I like the way you put it once. You know, you show a technique and then the implication is if you do this a hundred times, you get a really cool track. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I had a really good experience teaching at Berkeley. Uh, it was awesome having you, man. It yeah, was yeah. really cool to ha have you over there. For people that don't know, Bill took over my, um, my post at Berkeley Valencia earlier this year and he was teaching my sound design class and my electronic music uh, creation class and my ensemble uh, for a full six weeks. Yeah, it was good. Um, the sound design, yeah, it's just interesting teaching that way. It's very different to doing um, 
Ableton tutorials because with with Ableton tutorials it's just like here's one trick, bam, done. Whereas like with a how long is the course? Twelve weeks or something, or maybe even eighteen or however long it is. It's like it's very different, like developing a thing over that much time rather than developing a fourteen hour series or a a 10 minute tutorial. So yeah, I found it interesting. I really like it actually. I like developing, like thinking about teaching in that way. I like it. And it's the same reason I like this podcast as well. I think it just allows you to flesh ideas out a little bit more than you would on like other platforms and stuff like that. To- totally. I really like that um, while, while teaching a um, 14, 15 week course, you really get to know every person in that class. And you know, all, all these folk here, the, the, all, everyone that goes and decides to take a year off of their life and go to Berkeley, I mean, that is a huge leap of faith to say, I'm going to pay this much money just to focus on becoming better at something. Like being able to admit that you can be, be better at something, a lot of people can't even do that. It's really hard to just admit that you can be better at something because it almost breaks my heart to say, oh man, I could be more in shape <laughs> and to actually vocalize or that. Or like, then... you know, you, um, even in music, like you could probably be better at music theory, right? Yeah. Or like, you know, I, that, I have that thought all the time. I'm like, I could definitely know more music theory or I could, um, I could even get better at, you know, some forms of sound design or even composition. Like I'm not great at composition, I feel like, and stuff like that. But yeah, it is a tough thing, I think, to <laughs> to admit sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And, and, but everyone that ends up going and getting a master's at Berkeley Valencia they made that commitment of I am going to spend 10, 10 months to get better at music. And to me personally, that is a really inspiring environment to be around. I, I love being around that energy, people that have really taken a time out from whatever their life is, their background is, and say, I'm going to get way better at something. I'm going to immerse into new worlds that I've wanted to open and haven't had the time and space and energy and guidance to open and to just dive in. I So I think that in, in 15 weeks... Um, something I really love is just how you get to learn everyone's story. You know, people are from all cor- corners of the world and they bring all these different influences and they have different dreams and uh, they have different backgrounds. And to get involved in their stories and figuring out how how you can be a positive uh, intervention in their musical journey is uh, it's been just a, a really, really fulfilling part of my life. Nice. Fuck yeah. Well, um, let's talk about Burning Man. Yeah. Uh, I wanna... <laughs> so you just got back from Burning Man. Oh, gosh. Yeah, man. I am still sore <laughs> and dusty. And I'm still finding fire dust on things. Um, well, f- first of all, how many years in a row have you been to Burning Man? This was my ninth year. In, in a row? In or... 10 years. I missed one year. Okay, right. Took a year off. Crazy. Yeah, this has been something I've been I've, I've been trying to go to Burning Man for a while. There's a bunch of parties I've been trying to go to for like years now and just have never made it there. One is uh, Shambhala. One is Burning Man. Uh, Electric Forest is another one. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. I really want to play in Shambhala. If anyone from Shambhala is listening, I'd really love yeah, to play out there. Same. And um, apparently people who are like close with the Shambhala people have uh, like have asked before, hey, why hasn't Bill played here? And the answer has been because it was like too tough to book me or something, which I don't even know how the fuck that, that works. <laughs> You're hard so, to book, Bill. I don't think so. But <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. S- same goes for me. Yeah, if anyone's listening <laughs> wants to book me and burn a shambler, let's, yes. let's do it. Let's do a Z Bill back to back there. Y- yeah. Um, but Burning Man, yeah, I remember Burning that Man. year you, you were going to play. You yeah, so... I, I got to Sacramento to Evan Fruitbat's house and the so I had the fucking sweetest deal. Some guy hit me up and this happens every year, Burning Man. Every year, like three or four camps hit me up at least and go like, hey, you want to come play our camp? And they send me this like PDF of like some crazy geometrical oh, thing man, and they're yeah. like, this is what it is and the sound system's here and and I'm uh, my answer is always the same. I'm like, yeah, it looks great. Um, I just don't really have the time or money. So I said that to this one guy and he was like, I'll give you a ticket Plus, I'll like have like I'll camp you for like I'll have a place for you oh, to stay. Yeah, a camp. It's like an air conditioned campsite and oh, shit. That's and there's so like, sick. and he's what like, there's a, a full deal. meal plan and shit. And oh, he was man. like, you'll be totally looked after. I was like, sweet, sounds awesome. And then um, I got to uh, he he uh, he said also, can we get the fruit bat and Ryan uh, from Electricado to play? And in return, we would have given him a back to back between uh, me, Ryan, and the fruit bat. A back to back between me and the fruit bat. A back to back between Ryan and the fruit bat. <laughs> 
an Electricado set, <laughs> oh, like damn. two Mr. Bill sets, two Fruit Bat sets, and two Rhinosaurus. Like those, like ten sets. We would have given like a them, whole day. Yeah, we would have given them like basically a whole day worth of sets. Wow. Um, so it was like a decent deal. I would have had to put in a. Sh- I, I did put in a shitload of work to make all the sets. Yeah. Um, oh, and then what happened in Sacramento? So yeah, so he was like, "All right, I'll send three tickets, and you, all of you guys will be looked after." I was like, cool, here's Evan's address, send them to Evan. So uh, I booked my flights out to Evan's place and shit. I was just expecting like the tickets to just be at his house. So I got to his house. He's like, all right, so the car pass showed up, but the tickets did not show up. And I was like, fuck, um, <laughs> all right. So I tried to get in touch with the, the campsite guy. he was already guy. at Burning Man. Well, he was, but he answered his phone eventually. It took like a half a day to get in contact with him. He eventually um, answered his phone and was like, oh uh yeah did they not show up and i was like no they did not show up do you have like a tracking number or something and he's like oh i just like put them in an envelope and put them in a mailbox and i was like oh okay well they didn't get here so (laughs) oh my god so he's like oh well i guess they're just gone then and i was like wow okay those are they're so expensive i know it's like why wouldn't you like for something three tickets for that's like 1500 bucks i would want that hand delivered yeah and signed uh, on yeah totally <laughs> like burning least, man tickets are gold man yeah at least get a fucking signature or something like that man i felt so bad for one of my campmates this year um paid eighteen hundred dollars for a ticket for a ticket Holy to burning fuck, man last that's minute so much but that was that was how much the seller had paid it for it wasn't a scalper it was actually like it was a it was a like one of those FOMO tickets mm. that was also on t- on StubHub. I think StubHub is for scalping. I don't know, but anyway, it was what the seller had paid for it. He wasn't marking it up or anything. Wow. So oh um, for those listening who aren't aware, and this is something that took me a while to get my head around, is that Burning Man is like the only party on the planet where, as an artist, you don't get paid to play, and you have to buy a ticket, and you have to camp yourself for like a week, and like literally, you go there just to experience it and play, and like nobody gets paid, and like. No. The, well, I think you'll get it when you get there. I think um, yes. Yeah, the yeah. splendor of Burning Man surpasses what anyone can afford right yeah if you, once you're there and you're looking out on the open playa and you see i mean one neighborhood of burning man is like all of coachella right you know <laughs> one neighborhood's worth of art and music and talent basically and there's so much art and music and talent like everyone's an artist everyone that goes it is a celebration of artists by artists and for artists yeah and it is a ga- gathering place for artists to have a have a completely immersive ritual together and uh it it is not something that could exist if you had to pay for it right yeah, yeah. like if, if i was like a super rich elon musk guy and i was like i'm gonna buy me a burner man we're gonna have one <laughs> i would not be able to afford all the talent that goes up there no matter how much money you have in all the world and that's what makes it really special is the what, fact that so many people are just willing to give into it exactly yeah that that you could not have that event uh at, in a capitalist form yeah it's like flume went out there and played and ate ass on stage and let's he, talk about this and he didn't get paid to <laughs> no, do he that he did not <laughs> if you're not getting paid and you're flume <laughs> you know what to do <laughs> he, he, he got paid in ass <laughs> honestly i mean i think he played on the second half of burning man i would not eat anyone's ass during the second half of Burning Man. Oh, it's got to be just, yeah, it's got to be so <laughs> ratchet, dude. Unless they just came out like that night from the hotel, because I think it was his girlfriend's ass. Oh. Oh. Really? Make, yeah. what's, what's everyone making a big deal about? I didn't know that part. I don't know, but oh. like. Okay. Yeah. Well, I guess they just got there from the hotel. That might be nice. But still, there's actually a camp dedicated just to cleaning butts at Burning Man. Really? Yeah, yeah. They'll give you what? a squeaky <laughs> clean butthole. <laughs> And because they so, uh, address wait. the one problem that everyone has, which is that halfway through on, Burning Man. You've got to explain this further. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you go into the camp. Yes. Have you had your asshole clean in this not, camp? Not yet, but I have had camp members that have gotten back. And have there. they described the experience? Uh, yes. They, they describe it as leaving with a uh, squeaky clean. Okay. But what happens in between going in and leaving with a squeaky clean? <laughs> Um, I, I think there must be a, um, it must be kind of like a spa. And there's like somebody who cleans your ass? Um, or you I, clean your own ass and they just give you the materials to do I, so? I, you know, I, you might have the option. Burning Man's really, really big on, um, you know, consensual adult play. Mm-hmm. And uh, they wouldn't put you in a situation where, I don't think there'd be a camp that puts you in a situation where you feel like, uh, like you have to be touched by someone where you don't want to be. Yeah. yeah. So I imagine that the uh, butt cleaning camp uh, they have options for how you'd like your butt clean. Right. I would go for the day spa if I went. 
Right, and it's a uh, and a uh, that also would uh, be free, right? Of course, you just yeah. go in and get your asshole clean for free. Well, you probably there's probably a queue. <laughs> All right. Yeah, true. Yeah. So the so the uh, the cost is your time. Yes, okay. your time and and your patience. Okay, cool. But you can get anything for free there if you're patient enough. Yes, and I think that the, you know Burning Man, um, the economy is based on the concept of gifting. When you give things, it is a gift. It is not, you don't expect anything in return. And uh, that means there's also no bartering. A lot of people think you go there and trade stuff. And like, I don't hear people talk about trading anything. There's no camps based in trading. There's no trading there. Um, Stories from Burning Man this year. The Playa was, um, actually, I think my biggest story from Burning Man this year happened right off Playa. Um, On my way to Burning Man. Yeah. um, I... Well, me me and my girlfriend Amber stopped in uh, Winnemucca, and it was our last stop before going out to the desert. And, uh, you know, we had been driving for days and days, and I think we were a little bit out of it, but somehow, uh, I think this must have been my fault, it wasn't closed enough, the hatch of our car in the back like uh, of this uh, Passat just the hatch came open while we were driving away from this gas station. You didn't realize for a while. For th- like three miles, man. So just a bunch it. of shit was falling so out the back. So we stopped and we looked in the back and we were missing shit. And amongst the shit we were missing was my brand new laptop. Fuck. <laughs> inside of, it was sealed in plastic, inside, <laughs> uh, also concealed inside of a, of a, you know, my uh, uh, deep, my, my bag I didn't want to get covered in playa. Anyway, it was gone and I just melted down i felt so dumb we turned around and we actually went back and we were able to collect almost everything except the laptop the laptop was vanished and i'm just like you know that is such a such an easy steal i mean someone just gets that and and it's like now you have a nice brand new laptop and and i was i was we went up and down the road and i there was no trace of it it was definitely taken so I went to Burning Man kind of with my tail between my legs. I was feeling really sorry for myself. And I think that when I got to the playa, I just like let it go. That's something that really happens out there at Burning Man. You just you just kind of surrender to the dust. You're just like, I'm here. I'm not checking my emails. I am just one with the desert for a little while. I'm just doing what's immediately there in front of me that I feel like I must do. And I kind of let it go. And I just said, all right, fate, you know, maybe it'll come back to me. So um, by the Thursday at Burning Man, I was uh, doing a shift, doing uh, production at BMIR, the radio station there. And I got... Wait, there's a radio station at Burning Man? Yeah, I actually work for it. I, I help do their uh, commercials. Well, they're not commercials. They're, they're public service announcements. People just come in off the playa and they're like, hey, we're having a barbecue. And I'm like, all right, great. Let's get some country music going and let's do a crazy voice and you tell us where that barbecue is. We record it and we put it out on the air. <laughs> I love that it like becomes, is it, is it like a statistic or whatever that um, Burning Man or Black Rock City becomes like the fourth biggest city in Nevada? It's the third biggest city in Nevada. Like whilst happening. Burning Man is happening. Yes, while Burning Man is, is happening. So 70,000 people there. And at these poor little towns around it too never get so much people going through it. So yeah. it's kind of defined the area. Anyway, so on the Thursday of the burn, I got a message. My laptop was found and recovered. This lady... This really lovely uh, 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 woman hit me up and said her her dad had just found it on the road and it was safe and everything was cool and they found my name inside of it. And so as soon as I got out, off the playa, I met up with her. She's such a sweetheart. Her name's Jenna. And she gave me the laptop and um, um, Amber's missing bath bag, which we also thought probably wouldn't come back. Everything came back. We didn't actually end up losing anything laptop was in perfect condition he found it in the middle of the road and he just <laughs> threw it into his truck and like forgot about it until they were like oh let's track that guy down and it just happened to still be at burning man so i could Fuck. go pick it up that's it like how just... long burning man goes for is they forgot about it remembered to track you down and you were still at burning man <laughs> <laughs> i was still there right and uh, it was just so easy to pick it up on the way out anyway i got i, I have the guy's address i'm gonna send him a christmas card i love this man I can't believe, you know, I said to myself when it was happening, I said, I generally believe people want to be helpful. People want to be heroes when they can be, that they don't want to benefit off someone else's suffering. I just really trusted in that. And then 
bam, it happened. And normally I'm, I'm, I'm used to that happening like as an epiphany at Burning Man, but my greatest epiphany of love and kindness was actually right off playa this year. Fuck yeah, dude. That's awesome. Yeah, good to hear you got it back. That's so fucking crazy that you just fell out of your trunk. And... I can't believe it. can't believe it. I just bought this laptop. I researched it. I loved it, you know. What and kind of now laptop I'm... was it? Uh, it is, I got the nicest mid-2015 MacBook that you can get. Because I was on the verge of getting the brand new MacBook, but like, I, I even had my order queued up, and then it came time to buy dongles. And I was just uh, finding myself buying like a bunch of dongles and hating it like, every Fuck time this. I put one in my cart. It's, and I'm just like, yeah. I don't want this. I don't yeah. want to be this dork that has to carry around dongles <laughs> everywhere. I just had this meltdown about the new MacBooks, and I said, you know what, I'm just going to get the nicest one that you can get from the generation that I, I, I still liked, which was 2015. Yeah, so I, I think agree. It was a good I'm, move. I'm not a fan of like this proprietary system that, that Apple's using now. I uh, mean, after using your beast of a PC, I think I'm, I, I might move over to PC. Yeah, this I think is like a r weird one. It somehow is like operating at a, at a level that it shouldn't be, like based on its specs. <laughs> this is a freak PC. I don't really know why. Man, I mean, just the amount of Soothe plugins that you can run yeah, at the same yeah. time, it's just blowing my mind on that. Yeah, I don't know why. I mean, I've got a 7700K uh, quad-core i7 processor, um, 32 gigs of RAM, and it's all small form factor, like mini ATX shit, because I had to fit it into that rack. So, like, the airflow is not the best, even. And, like, there's so many things about it that should, like, bottleneck it. And I, I guess, like, everything on there is a solid-state hard drive, though. I will say that. So there's, like, four terabytes of solid-states in there. Whoa. Um, that's probably the best thing it's got going for it. But, I mean, other than that, it's not, like, anything super special. And, like, parts-wise, it probably costs about, like, two grand to build. Jeez. And it's just a fucking beast somehow. It is a beast. Yeah, I, I you know, after producing some music on your machine... I'm just like, why am I not rocking this speed right you should, now? You should get a, de it's like in so the studio, awesome. yeah, you'd need a desktop in the studio, I reckon, because it's just, when you're writing music, you want to not have limitations and speed issues and like you want the creative flow to be good. I mean, when you're playing live, you can maybe reel it back a tiny bit because you can, I mean, I guess for your setup, maybe not because you're running like Resolume as well. Yeah, well, you know, I think the other thing that compels me to stay with Mac is the fact that I'm working in education and all my students are on Macs. Yeah. And I just never want to have to deal with any incompatibility with my students, you know, and, that makes and sense. the majority of people that I'm interacting with. Uh, so, but I do think that w next time I have like a studio that I call home and I want to get like something nice in there, I would prefer a $2,000 super souped up PC over like the $5,000 like desktop Macs that just came out. Yeah, dude. Um, oh, yeah, 100%. The, the, those Macs, like the single screen ones, yeah. the, what are they, the MacBook Pros or whatever? The, the, yeah, Skyler uses one, and it's good. I mean, it's fine, but it's 7500 bucks is what he paid, which is just insane. Yeah, for 7500 bucks, the PC you could build, man, like, is just off yeah, the fucking charts. Yeah, you could build, like, something to t you know, from NASA. Yeah, like, <laughs> you, you could literally yeah, fucking build just the most insane shit. But I mean, I don't know, at this point, it feels like um, parts are just getting so good every year that like uh, Ryzen just put out um, this new processor. It's 500 bucks and it trumps any processor that's like 10 grand. Like there's, if, if you look at the benchmarks, like the next best processor after this one is worth like eight eight thousand dollars or something like that. Oh my gosh. So it's like um, now, like, you know, you can get a processor that's that good for, yeah. for 500 bucks. Um, next year it'll probably be the same. You'll probably be able to get another processor that's even better than that one for three hundred bucks. Like it's, shit is getting cheaper and better. So, I don't, but only in the PC world. It's, well, it's the same components that are used in Apple stuff. Yeah, I think Apple is mostly just Intel processors, so they they won't use AMD stuff. But um, it's a uh, it's all the same shit really. That's in my computer. That's in your computer. It's like basically the same shit. It's just that. Um, Apple just fucking proprietaryizes it all, like it just it's makes really, it all theirs. It's, it's really, really disappointing. Yeah, but you know, I got my 2015. I yeah. got it. Fuck yeah. I'm gonna make great music on it. Here's another thing, actually. After hanging out with Jan and, and some of her programmer friends, I've realized that actually Apple is better for programming on. Oh which yeah, I didn't... it's less hackable, or um, I think it's got to do with terminal. I don't really understand oh, okay. it, but um, yeah, apparently you have to like install fuckloads of stuff on a PC to like get it up to speed with. 
where Macs are for programming on, which I I always thought would be the opposite. I yeah, thought opposite. like I always yeah, I thought, thought that the PC was just like, would be way better for programming. Yeah, right? but really closer to the processor or whatever. Absolutely not the case. Yeah. Apparently, because um, I guess like on PCs you need to run like Ubuntu and shit like that. And yeah, yeah. Let's, let's take a quick break. Okay, sure. Yeah. All right, we're recording again. Sweet. Um, what do you want to talk about now? Sound design. Talk about yeah, sound design, composition, music, tracks, music writing stuff. Yeah. Yeah, cool. So, um, yeah, well, I guess what's your, uh, how do you, I don't know. I don't like to do this to be interviewee is the thing. Like, I think, <laughs> I think interviews are kind of lame. And I think the re the thing that makes this like cool, apart from like interviews and streams and tutorials and teaching and all that stuff is it's just like another way to get like all of your other thoughts out Yeah. in like not a way that's super geared by like interview questions. So, I mean, yeah, like you, it's more of a conversation. Yeah. Which I prefer. I think like, um, when you go do an interview they're like all right so what's your favorite vst plugin and like who are your influences <laughs> and what is your next like you know why don't you just uh check out my last interview yeah exactly yeah well what's next <laughs> in the pipeline for mr bill it's like shut up go away <laughs> <laughs> well maybe i should interview you because right. uh, i actually really think that that uh you you know you know i'm a big mr phil bill fan and uh i love uh how how many tracks that you seem to power through i honestly i only do like 10 tracks a year, you know, I want to be able to say I do one track a month, but sometimes oh, I'm more productive. Why other times though? Why? Like, why, what do you think it is that makes you just do, do 10 tracks a year? Well, um, I think it's been circumstantial every time. Um, with different, <laughs> with different <laughs> circumstances every time. Different circumstances. Like, uh, <laughs> um, uh, like a year and a half ago, two years ago, um, I, uh, I left a really long relationship. And leading up to then, I was not writing music. It was it was kind of a you know kind of a sad time for me. So are you like in the mindset of like when you're sad, you don't really write music? Well, that time I didn't. Okay, you know. So for me, um, <clears throat> I just got out of a pretty long relationship too, and I noticed it was actually making me way more productive. And the reason why is because I didn't really want to be around my girlfriend. So I was like waking up in the morning, coming straight to the studio just doing work all day didn't want to check my messages because i didn't want to see any messages from her and then i would go back home again and i would have pumped out a track that day you know and like yeah. i was just doing that every single day so i found it to be actually really productive to be in that situation yeah yeah exactly so you know circumstances can totally vary for from one person it could be a complete you know ending a relationship can be a complete vibe killer and for other people it can be um you know something that uh motivates them to to do other things productive things i don't i don't think it was necessarily motivating me to be productive i think it was just like it was motivating me to get out of the house and away yeah and therefore be here and therefore i was just writing a ton of music yeah you know, when but i was room. i didn't have a separate studio i was True, kind of yeah. sharing a house with uh, with uh you know some some energy that was hard to get super creative around but then, um, then I ended up making a really emotional record. I did uh, the it entity, it one? entity, yeah, yeah. and uh, you know I love having kind of concepts for the for the full sound of a, of a record. And for that one, I really wanted to, um, and this is something me and Zebler talked about for a long time that I was really eager to try. I really wanted to break away from traditional compositional structures. You know, we had talked about for so long, like oh, I'm just so sick of all bass music being just build up, drop, break down. Mm -hmm build up drop you know and uh so with that one i really i i tried to kind of move away from a lot of predictability uh compositionally at least and um i think for me emotionally it was kind of a reflection of how everything really in my life felt really unstable you know the, the music kind of um came through as being um on you know kind of unpredictable and unstable and at times really uh really really different from what you thought it might be you know and uh, I, I think that it was a it was a real it was a milestone of a record for me in its sound design and kind of the challenges I took on, but um, it, it didn't really produce a lot of interest. I don't think that I think that's the one the most over, uh, looked over uh, Z album that we've dropped. And that one took like a year and a half to come out. I was with. surprised actually because when you sent it to me, I was like, "This is fucking sick, and this is gonna do really well." And then it did not. And yeah. I think honestly. And no hate on Gravitas, but I think at the time, Jesse um, and John were just both really preoccupied with other shit. Like, I think Jesse, um, who, who, who manages Closey and now Beats Antique, I think, um, was just starting to, to get into that world. So I think he was pretty distracted there. And then I think John is like just continuously getting more distracted with his own career, which is fair. 
But um, yeah, so I think maybe that was what happened, actually. Yeah, and you know, I think the Z also we we didn't really that was our last thing that we did without proper management, and uh, at the time we had been managing ourselves, and I think after that we just kind of surrendered to the fact that like we don't really know how to market ourselves and like you yeah. know at, at manage our image as well as as um you know so many other artists out there so and you're um and when you say proper management you mean like uh, anand is your manager now right yes so uh, okay, right cool. after identity we took on anand as our manager who has shout been outs to anand. To- <laughs> shout out to anand re-evolution booking yeah. slash the unts um who's absolutely become like the the fifth beetle in in the dude he's the uh, the fifth Wait, well, wait. you know, the fifth Beatle, <laughs> but like the third Z member. The third Z. <laughs> He's the experience. Dude, I yeah, yeah, absolutely. I agree. Like with um yeah, Nanda's a great manager, man. I've like uh some offers on the table for other management at the moment who are like much bigger. But I'm I think I'm going to stay with Anand because he's just such a good dude to work with. Well, you know, that's the funny thing about management is that like you kind of want to hop to a bigger manager. You think that that's the next But then you're going to be a small step. fish. But then yeah, mm. you are small fish to the yeah, larger fish manager. Exactly. And um and you know, they're they're busy making millions off of acts that are like way bigger than you. Yeah. And you know, your emails just kind of might go unanswered for a while and you're exactly. you're low priority level. And yeah, I, I really feel like I don't know when Anon saw us, but at some point, um, An- Anon just really must have had some kind of Z vision and just really saw what we were doing and said, "Full support. I'm I'm going to help you guys grow." And he totally has, and he's been like such a, such a good team member for well, us. I, I think the same as like um, you or I getting better at production and better at music and better at writing and all that stuff. He's getting better at management, and I think a big part yeah. of that was um, was me joining him in like 2015 or, or I think early 2016. And I was just like, when I first was working with him, I was like, hey man, like emailing him every day, being on the phone with him like every couple of days, being like, hey, you got to do this, you got to do this, like just riding his ass, man. And then I think from that, he's like gotten better and also working with Desert Dwellers, he's gotten better and, you know, obviously working with you guys, he's he's getting better. But I think it's just like one of those things where you just do it enough and you just get better at it. And I think it's the same as anything, you know, music writing or management or... Yeah, and you know, this is this is a piece of advice that I gave my master's students a lot in the last couple of years because when you're getting out of Berkeley Valencia, you got a master's degree and you're you've got all these skills and you're about to go off and do job interviews, you're about to try to uh get your stuff in front of uh um, you know, labels that you like. And what I try to convey is that no matter what kind of business situation you're going into, it should feel really mutual. Totally. Uh, if it feels like if if you're approaching like an agency or a management who's like fe- like I'm doing you a favor, you know, then it's kind of a lopsided relationship. Yeah. But if you're working with people that are like, hey, let's grow together, then that's actually a, that's a really stable relationship. It's all it's actually coming back to to romantic relationships. It is just like what you'd want to get out of a partnership. If if you have like one person in a partnership being like, please date me, oh my <laughs> god, please, I need, and then you have the other person yeah. being like, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, you know, <laughs> sure, yeah, fine. sure, baby, yeah, that's not healthy. No, it's no. not it's not balanced. But if you have two people that are like, I, you know, I'm gonna grow in this direction. You're also growing in this direction. Let's grow together, support each other in different ways. Um, th- those are the best relationships out there, whether it's romantic or whether it is business, you know, totally, yeah. and whether it is musical. If you, it, you there has to be a, a mutual uh, feeling of, uh, of of uh, of of working for with each other and for each other. Yeah, I would agree completely. Um, so I guess I want to talk about uh, touring stuff. Like you, your touring is fucking on another level to <laughs> the kind of touring that I do. So the kind of stuff that I do now which has changed over the years. But but what I do now is I get offers, I turn them down if they don't hit my like lowest threshold. And I'm in a position now where I'm sort of teaching enough and doing enough other shit that I don't need to sort of take the those shows. And then uh, tried to be away from the studio for less than 24 hours. So I try to like fly out, do the show. And fl- like I, I try to take the, my rule of thumb is try to take the latest possible flight to the show and the earliest possible flight back to the show. So sometimes the way that works is I'll fly out of here at like, 3 p.m. on a Saturday 
and take the the 7 a.m flight out on a sunday from the city i'm playing in you know or even the 4 a.m flight sometimes like go straight from the club to the airport and just be straight back to the studio the next day yeah um which is very different from the way that you do it because you have that whole stage so you have to drive it obviously you can't fly that thing yeah so zebler and canty experience kind of started as inherently an audio visual project and our whole approach um, has been to be something that you got to experience, you know, something that you got to see. Um, because even when we started about 10 years ago, uh, th- I mean, I had been already downloading MP3s for 10 years. I did, just didn't see in the kind of music I wanted to make much of a market for um, selling it online, you know, or not much I can really super rely on unless I got really big. I just wanted to do shows anyway. I love doing shows. So we built this stage and um and and you know it's it's so large and labor intensive to set up we have to carry it around a trailer and have a stage manager our, our awesome buddy clear void devin devin i love devin so i lived <laughs> yeah. with him for a month in spain we <laughs> yeah yeah we had a good time well he's well he's zebler's number two man at zebler's studio yeah. and and so when zebler um who was also doing teaching in spain uh when he got hired by berkeley boston um, uh, Devin w- w- was able to take the reins over there. He's actually right about to go over there Devin? and start a new semester. Yeah. It's going again. Yeah. Damn. Him and Alicia are going to be working together. Fuck yeah. But, uh, but yeah, you know, it's, I think that what we, we tour like headliners, even though we're not big enough to be headliners. Yeah, yeah. We look like headliners, mm-hmm. even though we're not. And, um, you know, uh, our, our our idea is that if if we look like a big show, if we get people really appreciating it, then they'll 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 pay the necessary amount in order to get that stuff out. You know, it's not just getting a DJ out; it's like a whole experience that you're hiring. Yeah, but unfortunately, it doesn't work that way because it works like it's purely an economic thing, isn't it? Because it's like um, uh, to, to the promoter, it's like yeah you're like i mean to a passion promoter it's like yeah fuck yeah you bring like this whole thing but to like what i've realized over the years is to like when i was doing that visual show i was realizing to promoters like even though i was bringing like five people with me i was bringing a drummer i was bringing my own opening act which was circuit bent who are fucking awesome yeah and then i was bringing like this whole big fucking stage and like everything was like really highly and well produced i think um i mean the shows in my opinion looked really good uh even though i was doing all of that to the promoter i was like at the end of the night settling and they were just like well this is how many ticket sales you did and it's like all right so i'm just a i'm just ticket sales to you bros <laughs> <laughs> well i mean their job is to sell the tickets exactly that's what i mean it's like a full economy so it's like to uh your your worth is sort of really just based on ticket sales it seems like well i i mean I, I love the, you said that the passion promoters, I, I love that uh, term because I feel like Z has had the the pleasure of working with a lot of passion promoters. Totally. Yeah. Likewise. And, um, you know, people that will put in an extra effort to get people out, even if you're not as popular as, as, you know, a household name. Like, yeah. They were like flyer festivals and shit like that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they, they just, they, I find the other factor is having a solid community I remember when, um, when during the breakcore era, for instance, from about 2008 to 2010, um, I was involved in a lot of awesome, like kind of underground raves and you just trusted the people throwing them that they were going to have a fire lineup. You really trust the curator. And I find a lot of the time people bringing Z out to parts of the country is, you know, their crews are basically friends and artists that, that really, um, they, they're, they're. Uh, well, I guess as Nicole from Blackbox would put it, they're moving through sound, not hype. Mm-hmm. Which uh, I don't actually even agree because, like, when you go in there, it's just slathered with cursor stickers and <laughs> cursor shirts. <laughs> and, like, it's literally like the hype den for cursor. <laughs> but uh, I'd, cursor I also, is sound. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, yeah he, that's his side project. <laughs> I mean, to be fair though, yeah, his sound is fucking awesome. Yeah. Moving through people through cursor, not hype. <laughs> yeah, totally. That should be the new slogan. <laughs> Moving people through slug wife, not anything else. <laughs> love you, Nicole. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, Nicole is so cool. I mean, I, I love her so much. And I love the fact that she's gone from like uh, throwing, you know, Tuesday nights at Cervantes to like buying a fucking venue. And it's like the best venue in the country, in my opinion. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, she, she really 
you know, she's one of these community contributors that she's a New York sets hustler, man. such a <laughs> such a bar and it sets such a, a a great tone for what um creative community and creative culture could be. Yeah. Yeah, man, she's she's great. And um yeah, the black box it just sounds so fucking good. Like they I think what they have the function tops, but the guy like who runs the sound there, I can't I always forget his name, but I, he's awesome. He um built the subs specifically for the room. The base couch crew. Yeah, dude. And yeah. fuck, it just sounds so nice. No, it? and they, they tune it a little by little all the time. They're yep. putting new sound dampeners in there. They really believe in it making like the best base cave in Denver. It really is the best base cave in Denver. I yeah. went to Cervantes last night, the other side, and I haven't been there in a long time. I mostly have just been going to the black box and I think... Yeah, it's pretty much the only venue I go to now. <laughs> um, and yeah, after just going to the black box so much I, and going back to Cervantes, I'm like, ugh. <laughs> it's just not comfortable. It's like, I mean, Cervantes is bad, but the black box is just so good. Yeah, I, I think that Cervantes and the other side are probably best also when crews bring their own sound in. The yeah. sound reinforcements really help. Yeah, so actually um, I'm doing a show uh, with Chris Kilsmith there on October 4th and we were thinking about bringing our own sound in. We were going to get a Hennessy rig from Mountain something. It's like some company. Oh, that's um, awesome. And Skylar did that actually and he told me, he was like, oh yeah, it was only like 500 bucks and I was like, what? Fucking I'm totally doing that. And then I wow. looked into it and they were like, no, it's actually like two grand and I was like, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, not possible unfortunately. Sorry oh, everybody man. coming to that show. But I did see some like messages on the event page of people being like, hey, are you going to use the Savante system or like what's going on there? <laughs> yeah, people care in Denver. That's what I I love about yeah. around here it's really cool yeah it's a big sound system culture here and yeah people do like their sound systems and there's also like a yeah, huge culture around just like really good big sounding shows with cool visuals which is perfect for what you do <laughs> yes we get more plays and messages and requests from denver than any other town in the u.s so i, I kind of feel like this is my home planet whenever i come back it is like a hundred percent the base capital of the universe like a hundred percent or at least the world <laughs> Yeah. No, I, you know, I'd really love to spend more time here sometime. And uh, I mean, I know everyone, all bass music producers are flocking to Denver. Yeah. Like of the trees just got here. Of the trees. Um, welcome to town. Symbionic just got here. S welcome to town. Symbionic. Um, yes. Well, yeah. Who else moved here? Uh, it's a bunch of people. Yeah. It's definitely a lot of, a lot of bass music people coming here. I think for that reason, it, it's ideal in so many ways. It's ideal in the sense that, um, I mean, you can you probably play here more than any other market. Like you, Actually, yeah, like three times a year. Nowhere else in the country can I play like three times a year and have yeah, people show Yeah, there's not up. a lot of other places you can do that. Yeah. Um, so there's that. Also the fact that uh, there's just so many people here to collab with and shit like that, and it's just good to like hang out with friends all the time, and it's just everyone's here. Um, and also the flights to other sides of the country are cheap from here. Like, you know, flying That's the ticket. Yeah, flying from here to, to the east coast is cheap and flying from here to the west coast is cheap. So it's like ideal in, in that logistical way too. Yeah, if you're if you're a fly out artist, this is the place. Yeah, totally. Yeah, well, yeah I guess it doesn't matter because you'll just drive anyway. Well, that's the thing. It's like uh, the, the last couple of years we have just been doing driving tours, but we have been doing more fly outs. And the Zebler and Canty experience is an evolving idea. It doesn't always have to involve visuals. I prefer it when it does. I feel kind of weird on stage when I'm playing my own tracks and there's no visuals. But sometimes. I mean, like, if it but, got big enough, like you could totally, you know, just go into big clubs like Beta and, and take shit. over their take over the visuals. That's the way we actually did in China. We've done two China tours now, um, from a passion producer, Juan Zhao, Juan, is an yeah, amazing I'd love, guy. I'd love to do some stuff with Juan. Oh, he loves you. Yeah, I've, I've been emailing with him. It just hasn't worked out yet. Oh man, and his stuff sounds like you, Bill. He sent me he sent me like five tracks. And asked me my opinion on it, and I'm like, "Whoa, you are sounding <laughs> like Chinese, Mr. Bill." <laughs> Fuck yeah, dude! <laughs> he's awesome. awesome. Juan, I got nothing but love for. He's my, he's my brother, and he brought Z over to China twice. And um, uh, basically, every gig that we did, um, he was a great uh, road manager. He hit up all the venues, made sure they had visuals for us. Some of the clubs were huge, some of them were tiny, and at every show was uh, we had a pretty good time. Nice. And uh, the Chinese are genuinely, I think, in, you know, curious about um, about uh, w Western culture in general and uh, and uh, Western electronic music because the, it's it's really it's amazing how much the internet can define your culture and what you know and what you celebrate. Uh, in China, they have a firewall, and you can't use Google, SoundCloud, Bandcamp, Facebook, 
And right. so as I'm rattling these off, it's like, do you even exist once you move these away? <laughs> once you once you cut these off, do you exist? And the answer for most people is no. You do not even exist on China. Chinese internet. So um, Juan helped us uh, create a, a footprint in uh, ch- on, ch- on a Chinese market. And since they have like five times more people in the U.S., if you even get a, sm- a percentage of, of electronic music fans onto you, then it is like five times as many as you would have in the U.S. in any given spot. Yeah, it's the same as India. I go to India now probably about once a year. Oh, and I'm so I'm, jealous. It's oh, fucking awesome. I will trade dude. you China for India. Done. Okay, <laughs> deal. <laughs> We're like, we just a, a fucking global <laughs> economist at this point. Yeah. I'll trade you this country for this country. <laughs> I will trade you. I'm, well, I'm, a, I'm a British colonizer today. <laughs> yeah, uh, India is great. I'm going there again actually in, uh, in November. But um. Yeah, it's the same there. There's so many people, and if you can just like make a small impact there, then yeah, you, <laughs> it's a lot of fans. Um, I would, I would love to go to China though and do some stuff there. Yeah, I'd re- I'd I'd really I I love China. I adore China. Um, and but I'd really love to go to India too, especially because um my favorite um vocalist to work with is uh, Ganavia. Oh yeah, you've done a couple of songs with her. Right? Yeah, she was on Energy, and uh, um, we've actually started making a solo record for her. Sweet. Yeah. We're was kinda... she a Berkeley student too, or had she you... was? But when I started, um, she was actually a fellow, um, which is like a a post grad who's working for the college. Um, so she never took any of my classes, but we uh, became really good friends, and uh, instantly in the studio, we just it's it's so easy to work together. You know, I'm I'm following her. I don't want to like pretend I know how to write Indian music. So, you know, whenever we work on a track, we basically just start with tempo and some kind of tonic, and she starts flowing with it. And I start it's like a conversation, and uh, I really, really love working with her. And she is so just. I mean, she could be at a festival, and put down the mic and project her voice, and everyone in the crowd will be able to hear her. She has this this all this magical aura when she sings. I haven't met so many people in my life that gives me goosebumps like every time I hear them sing. And she just brings me to my knees. So I feel like um, it's a real pleasure and honor to work with her. She's been my gateway into understanding a little bit about Indian music. And uh, I would love to to soak up a lot more from the from the source and go over there at some point. Yeah, have you learned about like Kanadic music and stuff like that? Yeah, I've actually learned about that more through my um, uh, students than anything else. We had two really good... Um, Canardic uh, art, uh, artist in this last year's program. Nice, yeah. I um, uh, last year I went to India. I didn't actually go to play. I, I just went to like talk at a uh, this event. Um, it was called Sound Exchange by a company called EarthSync in Chennai. Oh, cool. And they had like a ton of panels there, and I was just like talking on one of the panels about like just how I do my shit. And um, all the other panels were like a lot of them were yeah about Indian music, and I watched a bunch of them. It's pretty interesting. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, I could see you going. Totally nuts with, yeah. with their uh, rhythm systems. Oh, uh, dude, like ragas and shit. Yeah, holy shit, that's so complicated. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I love that stuff. I, I don't know a lot about it, but yeah, it's uh, every time I I see it, I'm like, wait, so you just remember like all these patterns? <laughs> yeah, like 32 bars too that they can uh, yeah. kind of go back and forth with. Yeah, it's really really extraordinary. Yeah, it's crazy. I would definitely love to get more into world music. See, that's another thing is like you can admit there that you're you know, not a professional at world music. and that you're <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> yeah, I don't even think that's a hard thing to admit, actually. Yeah. I mean, I'm originally from Alaska, so um, I did not grow up immersed in that, that uh, you know, exposure to a lot of, I mean, even modern rave music was new to me when I got to uh, college. I had never been to a dance party. Wait, so you were born in Alaska? Yeah, I was born and, and raised. You lived and didn't leave until what age? Till I was 18. Oh, wow. Okay, so you spent the first 18 years of your life in Alaska. Well, you know, we we went out on a couple of uh, family trips, but yeah, I did. I did uh, actually, the first 10 years of my life, uh, I grew up in a family cabin, and we didn't even have running water, so I was running out to an outhouse uh, for 10 years when I was growing up. Nice, dude. And the coldest part, too. I mean, it got down to like 70 below. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you, you got the full rural outback experience. <laughs> outback. Yeah, outback. Uh, <laughs> the fucking American. It, it, it was yeah, it was a pretty complete Alaska <laughs> growing up experience. Um, but uh, you know, my cousins had it even crazier. They lived down on an island 
Wow. And uh, you couldn't get to their place without a, yeah, without a a little, you know, little plane and then taking a boat. Oh, fuck. Uh, So they're much more Alaskan than I am. I mean, I'd still say it's pretty Alaskan living in shit that gets 70 below. And like you said, um, certain times of the year, uh, it just doesn't get light, right? It's just dark. Yeah, yeah. During the wintertime, um, a lot of people in Alaska are affected by SAD, seasonal oh, yeah, affective sad. disorder. Yeah, I've heard sad. about that. You get like salt lamps to you fix get it or whatever. So sad. I don't know if salt lamps actually fix it, but yeah. Uh, everyone has these like lights that emit like sunlight frequency like that's supposed light. to help yeah right so um i heard about these things recently they're like ear earbuds or ear pods or airpods or whatever the fuck you call them like you know those like mac fucking things people wear at airports and shit um you put those in and they shoot blue light into your ears and Whoa. apparently that's a really good way to get it into yourself <laughs> yeah get the happy in there come on serotonin <laughs> <laughs> oxytocin <laughs> yeah it's a little like that yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so did, yeah. did you ever get seasonal affective disorder oh hell yeah I mean, so do you reckon that's why you're so because you, you're like one of the cheeriest people i think i know do you think that's why it's because like you you've sort of been lifting weights your whole life with your <laughs> serotonin <laughs> yeah my serotonin receptors is like twice <laughs> as big as most people yeah you're like oh man i had to like produce it under nothing now i've got actual sun like, this is oh crazy. man i never thought about that bill but maybe you're onto something <laughs> maybe normal sunlight for me is just like it's like steroids yeah absolute steroids <laughs> i feel that way coming out of burning man i feel like that i just sense. soaked up so much sun that i'm just a sunflower yeah <laughs> burning man's gonna be crazy for your serotonin if you're getting kind of fucked up every day <laughs> i mean the worst part is at the end of the week everyone's got like five different kinds of hangovers oh shit oh yeah <laughs> fuck that makes sense yeah it's gotta be oh man i, I didn't think about that it's got to be the grumpiest place on the last day right oh man that's really the make or break when you find out um the sheep from the wolves when you find out the, the hardcore from the softies it's not you know setting up is great people get to the playa they're like stoked they're well fed they're well slept and they they beast up the whole camp and they feel great and they love each other and by the end of the week um you know if you're not helping with tear down you are an asshole it does not matter <laughs> if you were really helpful in the beginning if you cooked a great meal if you are slacking on like yeah. taking things down and being helpful in the end it's like that's the moment people shine that's the make or break a burning man so what is it like a like a day of sort of tear down Oh gosh, for us this year it was uh, more like two days, but two uh, days. it can last like three days. Because not only do you got to tear down everything, but it's a leave no trace event. Yeah, so you got to make sure in. there is nothing yeah. left. I mean, you go with a comb and you look for like sequins. Really? Yeah. Holy fuck. Yeah. It's intense, man. Yeah, it's it's pretty intense. It's not for everybody. <laughs> I I think that it's very irresponsible for people to go around and just recommend everyone go to Burning Man, but it, I, I do not recommend it for everybody. I think I'm going to go next year um, for 36 hours. Yeah, Jan is like, yeah, let's go for 36 hours. I'm like, I'm, I'm into it. Let's do it. Or maybe like... Uh, let me talk you into 48. You 48? Can, you can yeah. stay with my camp. It'd be great to have you out all right, there. All right. Yeah, let's do, let's do 48. Yeah. <laughs> I, I bet you're going to really appreciate the extra 24. Okay. I, and if I'm enjoying it, maybe I'll do 36. No, sorry, 72. Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. I think you'll enjoy it too. I mean, it's... I, as an artist, it is a truly a place where you can soak up like new inspiration, absolutely carefree. Yeah, I want to take my electric bike out there too, so I can just like hoon around on that. Oh man, yeah. I mean, people with electric bikes out there, they might as well have a Tesla. Fuck yeah. <laughs> and I also want to um, uh, play some sets and stuff. And... Oh, you play huge sets out there, I'm sure. Nice. Yeah. So that's the fucking thing, man. Is like the year that I was supposed to go. I was supposed to play right before Skrillex. Uh, sorry, right after Skrillex, I think. It was either oh, right before man. or right after on camp question mark. Oh, dude, that would have been sick. That's one of the nastiest rigs. It just sounds like it just sounds like an earthquake from a mile away. Yeah. You, that was and, apparently... you know, I got to tell you, Bill, one thing that you're going to love is the acoustics of the open desert. Mm-hmm. You're just not used to hearing that. Yeah, you because the sound used, is just not... The sound is like, yeah. in. first of all, the air is dry. Yeah. And... Yes, yeah, so, so sound travels differently in humid air to dry air, right? Exactly. Yeah, the, the air is is really crispy dry, and there's no walls, there's no nothing anywhere for sound to reflect off. So if it's going out into the open playa, you, you hear the impact of, of kick drums and bass drops and stuff without natural reflections but in natural space mm-hmm. it's just the acoustics of burning man it is 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 a is a natural phenomenon 
So you would say um, it's also like uh, an event where you could probably hear the best sounding systems you've ever heard. Too. Yes, definitely. Oh, yeah. wow. Okay. Everything is out there. Turbo Sound, Function One, you know. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, Hennessy is pretty new, but I'm sure there might be one or two out there. And then, of course, big old honking PK is out there. Right. Uh, yeah. Fuck yeah. I love those systems. Um, so yeah, actually, I hope I can get Tipper onto this podcast um, because I'd love to talk to him about sound systems because I've had this conversation with him before about function ones. And um, you know how everybody sort of like associates him with function ones because yeah, he just always yeah. plays on them and he love he likes them, obviously. But um, I've talked to him about it before. I'm like, do you really think that like no other sound system can even come close to function ones? And he's like, no, I don't believe that. And I was like, of course, that's like you'd have to be fucking... Not not an idiot to believe that, but I mean, like, God it's, it's, has spoken. It's obviously not true. Yeah. <laughs> and um, but people make like stop these... fetishizing function one. <laughs> yeah, totally, <laughs> dude. The other day, like, I made a tweet, um, being like, like, because you know, Tipper came here, we spent a bunch of time in the studio and made like a track, and then uh, he left, and I made a tweet saying, "Oh, my asshole has been blown out, my brain, or something like that." <laughs> I remember that one. And yeah. um, and then I got a te a bunch of texts from people being like. But one of them was the dumbest shit I've ever heard. One of them was like, hey, man, can you like settle an argument that me and my friend are having right now? Is it true that Tipper produces on Function Ones in his studio? And I was just <laughs> like, how fucking stupid do you have to be <laughs> to fucking think that that's the case? Dude, that is an easy argument to settle just by Googling a picture of Tipper. Yeah. And looking at his studio, which I've done. Is there a picture of that? Yeah. He's got he's got these uh he's got these barefoot. The barefoot, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that is what he uses. But um yeah, he was using footprints for a while and he he ended up selling them and went back to the MM twenty sevens because he was like, Yeah, I can't not have MM twenty sevens. <sighs> Dude, I feel like once you get MM twenty sevens, it's hard to go back. It's like the sound is being beamed into your head. Yeah, it's so fucking nice. Yeah. <laughs> Um, fuck man, yeah, I really want to go to Burning Man. I'll I'll do it next year. Everyone yeah. I know, yeah, like, get, uh, you know, a lot of people I know are coming next year. Devin, he's gonna oh, come. Clear Void gonna come his first time, hopefully next nice. year. It's supposed to be this year, but he's coming next year. Cool. Zebler's coming again. He wants to take his girlfriend. Nice. Um, and uh, yeah, just a a big lineup of of friends who had took taken the year off or a couple of years off. Uh, it seems like they're all culminating it in a crazy twenty twenty burn. So. Fuck yeah. Gotta get out did there. you um did you catch any sets this year? I obviously you probably did, but like. you know the most sets I caught was with a campmate that I brought, I came out with this year. Um, uh, when we were in China, we met this DJ named Asuka, mm -hmm. who um she she was dropping Z music and a lot of dark trap sounds in Shanghai, and man, when I heard her, her stuff is like really really good. Next time we went to China, she opened for Z, and I swear she's one of the best DJs I ever heard. Nice. We got in a conversation about Burning Man. She's like, I want to go. Let's do it. And I said, <laughs> you got to camp with me. Let's do it. So um, she did it, and it was her first time in the United States. Can you imagine oh, okay. getting off the plane and just going to Burning going Man? To Burning Man. <laughs> so Asuka, the trap queen of China, came out to Burning Man this year and destroyed every sound system that she got on. Okay. She's so professional. And she has such an ear. She did some t transitions that were just, that blew my mind. And um, yeah, I think I, I saw like three or four of her sets and uh, they were some of the best Burning Man sets I've ever seen. If, if yeah. you guys, uh, anyone's listening, you know, type in Asuka, Trap Queen of China and you're going to find probably her That's mix her name, club. the Trap Queen of China? Well, you know, her, her name is Asuka with a, with a dollar sign for the S. That's very well, trappy. That's, that's super trappy, <laughs> but that's that's a little harder to search for. Trap Queen of China, though, there's only one, and her name I think, is Asuka. I think it's funny how like old trap DJs they like make their name and then just remove all the vowels and replace them with like V's and shit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not hip being easy to Google. Yeah, no, fuck that. <laughs> fuck <laughs> SEO, that's lame. If you can Google my witch house project, is it really a witch house project? That, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not a witch house project until it's unfindable. Until it is virtually unfindable on the you internet. To like download Tor browser and shit. To yeah, if you can't do the ASCII symbol for uh, an upside down cross and a triangle, then don't even try searching for me. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah, what even is that in ASCII? It's like you have to do a finger combo and shit. Yeah, yeah, you need to make like a devil horns and, and yeah, <laughs> hit several buttons at once, I'm sure. I'm not that trap anymore. So Tipper was there. Did you see him play this year? Apparently he goes out every year. Oh, man. You know, I thought that he was going to play. Um, and then uh, I thought I was going to catch him later in the week because I heard that he was doing a set at a camp I was playing at. 
Uh, but then I guess he left a little early, so I missed Tipper this year. Yeah, right. So is that also a thing that happens at Burning Man? It's like kind of impossible to know the schedule for the whole thing? Honestly, when I'm out there most years, the concept of time just really disappears. And your experience is mostly roaming around with kind of trajectories, but not necessarily a definite, you know, missions. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there will be an artist you have to just go out and see <laughs> once or twice. But in general, Burning Man's all about the, the meander and the roam. Right. Yeah, it seems like everyone I talk to has that idea about it. Yeah. Yeah, you'll see when you're out there. Yeah, Tommy Sidecar, Tommy from Beats Antique, he said, um, he told me, he's like, Burning Man, it's like, yeah, the, it's not the things that happen that are cool. It's like how the things happen that are cool. He's <laughs> like, it's all the shit in between that is cool. Like how you get to a place or like how you end up on a stage playing music or like, he's like, all the actual events that you end up being like, right, this is the thing that is happening is like not the actual cool thing. It's like the things in the journeys in between. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I, I would say my best Burning Man stories are definitely the ones that were really unexpected though. This year, um, <laughs> we did do something really funny. Uh, I did a sunrise set posing as a desert dwellers. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> I published it in the rockstar librarian as the desert dwellers, which is, a long time favorite pun of me and Zebler's and everybody's. So instead of the Desert Dwellers, it was just me playing Desert Dwellers music. And I sampled a bunch of cooking shows like, now it's time to add the sugar. And I would like, <laughs> I would like drop these samples like before. How long did it take you to make all of these edits for the set? Oh, uh, one evening. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I love that you spent a night on this. <laughs> I spent one night on it. I also made a tapestry that says Dessert Dwellers. Uh -huh. Wait, how long did it take you to make a tapestry? Oh, it was the same evening. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you just spent a whole night on spent this. Spent one night on this. But I also went to Walmart and got sweets. Okay. And uh, I invited a bunch of people I knew to bring sweets and we would all be Dessert Dwellers. <laughs> and while, during the set... People would go around and serve desserts to people, and uh, it was it was pretty glorious. Especially because Trevor from Desert Dwellers did come by, and he actually made a bunch of T-shirts that say Desert Dwellers on them. So anyone that was lucky enough to be there and like giving out sweets and stuff uh, got his blessing. I think he was really tickled that we did a tribute to him in such a cheeky way. <laughs> <laughs> that's so sick I, I like that that just like formed as well like this is the kind of things that i hear about burning man i'm like it sounds like the dumbest shit this so dumb. like um can you tell me anything about a place there called the ministry of disinformation oh yeah yeah actually the ministry of Dis Dis misinformation is uh playa favorite for sure but one thing uh, uh my one interaction with them is um is uh they'll go out there with like a megaphone Someone will be walking around. They'll be like, where are you going? You'd be like, I'm going to center camp. They're like, you're going the wrong way. And they will give you <laughs> elaborate instructions to some place that, you're, that is not where you should be going. They're really, really good at lying to people. <laughs> That's what I've heard. So, so the way I heard about this was uh, Duncan Trussell. Do you know that guy? He's a, he's a comedian. Um, I heard him talking about it on a podcast. It actually might have been the Joe Rogan podcast, or it might have been his own. I don't know. And he's like, "Yeah, man." I went. So he went to Burning Man, and he's like a comedian. So he's like really good at fucking explaining shit. Um, I feel like stand-up comedians are just so good at talking and explaining shit. Yeah, that's like their f job um, to like to explain these insane thoughts that they're having. So uh, he was explaining this thing, and he's like, "Yeah." So I was like sitting at the bar, and then um. You know, the guy just talking to me at the bar is just like lying to me, telling me like all this bullshit. And then and then I'm like, I know you're lying. Like, this is all fucking bullshit. And then he's like, all right, yeah, yeah, I am lying to you. And then starts telling me about how he like brewed the vodka that he's drinking or whatever. And he's just like, you're just fucking lying to me again. And like, and, but the way he explained it was so funny. I was like, holy shit, I want to go in and get lied to. This sounds so fucking good. <laughs> oh man yeah i i love that that's the interactive element of burning man is that like so good you know because camps can sometimes think of the, the funnest and cheekiest ways to get interactive two years in a row we've been next to a camp called retro frolic it's like they're kind of a um they're kind of a bondage and discipline camp they have like a little <laughs> little secret dungeon area you can get to but in the front they, they're normally like interacting in fun ways. And one year they had a bunch of priests out there with these paddles and they're like, confess your sins, confess <laughs> your sins. And I looked in there, I was, I was passing by and there was this, there was this girl there that was like, I put wet naps in the porta potties. And they're like, sinner and spanking her. <laughs> 
<laughs> it was exactly as advertised. You come and confess your sins to these priests who, and they spank who paddle you. you, and it was Jesus. it was just simple, absolutely stupid fun. <laughs> Yeah, I gotta come next year for sure. Yeah. yeah. No, so, we're gonna... what's the best method if I'm if I want to go? Like, when do I get a ticket? Just as soon as because they always just sell out instantly, um, right? Yeah, it, I would say um, you know if you can buy them directly, then that's great. But honestly, honestly, um, I normally wait until like a month before the burn, and then people who are getting rid of their tickets, like a lot of people buy four, and then they're they don't no one wants to be stuck holding a ticket while their friend or someone really cool doesn't have one. Right. So I find that, in general, tickets get to who they need to get to. Okay. Unless you wait till like, two days before the burn to, 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 to go. Then it, yeah. Yeah, that was what happened the year I was supposed to go. Um, The guy who I was supposed to be camping with, he was like, dude, just go to the gate. You'll find one. And I was like, yeah, but I want to fucking... Oh, I wouldn't recommend that. There are yeah. always these, like, uh, just, you know, kind of freeloading-looking sparkle pony hippies, like, sitting outside the gate with their... Their uh, their signs looking for a ticket, and I'm like, who's who's gonna come up and be like, oh, I'm all the way here at the all the way at the bur- at the yeah, gate yeah, of yeah. Burning Man before I'm like, oh, I should give away my extra four hundred dollar ticket. Who does that? No one brings a ticket yeah. to the gate of Burning Man unless you're gonna, gonna gonna <laughs> use it. You know? I don't know. Maybe I'll just buy one off the website if I can. I hear they sell out real quick. Yeah, they do. You basically get in a queue, get in a line, and and they're gone. But there's there's another sale. There's like an OMG sale, and you know the sooner that you th- this is the advice I give to you and anyone else that's thinking about going, the sooner you can commit to going, then the easier it's going to be on you. Right. Because th- th- then it's then you get the cheaper can... plane tickets. Yeah, yeah. You can plan way in advance who you're camping with. Make mm-hmm. sure it all feels really great. I think I would drive because I would want to take my bike. And... Yeah, oh, and you're so close. You're, I mean, yeah. close relatively to other yeah, places. How, how long is it from here to Berlin? It's actually a little far. It's like 20 hours. That's not close. That's not close. That's super far. I mean, but I came from the East Coast, so I'm like, oh, Denver's really close. You can, <laughs> it's only a day's long drive. <laughs> a day? That's two, bro. Yeah, 20 yeah, hours, that's like... And yeah, we stopped in Salt Lake City. Yeah, that's a two-day drive. It's basically here, Salt Lake City, Burning Man. That's like nothing in between. Yeah, totally. But driving through the Salt Flats is really cool. Oh, yeah. yeah, you know, I'd never seen them before. They're fucking awesome. Yeah, you know, funny story about the salt flats. So it's like four o'clock in the morning and I am really tired and it is pitch black outside and it just looks like I'm driving into an endless void and I'm starting to fall to sleep almost, you know, and I'm like, all right, next rest stop. And I pull over, I hit this rest stop and when the sun came up, I realized I'm on the salt flats and it was just, I had no idea if there was mountains on the side of me or hills <laughs> or prairies, yeah. but I was not expecting horizon to horizon salt yeah, yeah, yeah you know it was it was crazy i think i've only ever gone through there in the dark and i never let the sun rise yeah it's really cool to see for sure yeah you could totally just drive through. yeah people who took their cars out there and stuff next yeah. time we're just gonna we're gonna go for it we're gonna just set the land straight. speed record for people with burning man stuff on top of their car <laughs> That's like the most obscure record to be known for. I got a lame claim to fame. <laughs> nice. Fuck yeah, man. Well, um, I mean, that's pretty that's pretty good. That's like an hour and a half of podcast. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, do we have, let's see, any, any really good parting thoughts? Because I'm sure that some people listening to this are probably like music producers and they're like, oh, snap, and Canty and Mr. Bill have a good sit down. But mostly we bullshitted about Burning Man. <laughs> Which I think is educational, though, because I think, um, I mean, it's educational for me, at least. And I feel like if I find it engaging, at least somebody else will. And I feel like a lot of the my fans are definitely people who haven't been to Burning Man. I feel like I have a lot of like, uh, a lot of like, you know, computer geeky sort of nerdy fans. Personally attacked. <laughs> yeah, they're <laughs> triggered. We're, we're talking about you. Yeah. <laughs> That's you, bro. <laughs> yeah. That's for you. Sure. Just sitting in their room. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, I don't know, like, I think it's interesting to hear it from you because, uh, I mean, A, I think you're a really honest person, but also you've been like for nine years, it's a lot of experience. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it, it's a very special place for me and, um, I will never stop talking about it at length because <laughs> there's, it's so rich. I, I think you're maybe the, um, like I've been told about Burning Man by hundreds of people 
and I think you're the favorite person to hear it from for me. Oh, that is like, such an honor like, to and, have and that I think, But I title. feel that way about a lot of shit. Like, even you just talking about the soul flash, just, and I'm like, yeah, you would have explained, like, it sounds so much cooler when you explain it, because I would just be like, yeah, it's just a fucking shitload of salt. <laughs> like, it's all flat. And you're like, oh, horizon to horizon of salt. It's like, just sounds so much more majestic when you say it. Oh, man. Yeah, we took jump shots, too. It was great. Fuck I'm going to yeah. go out there again. Next, next year I go out, I'm definitely taking some time to like go fucking drive out on the salt flats oh dude yeah fuck yeah i've never done that but yeah i'd be super down to do that uh, another thing is i really like salt lake city because it's um you know when you're in denver everyone's like yeah denver the mountains it's like yeah you're in denver but the mountains are real far away they're not like close to the city at all when you're in salt lake city the mountains are like right there yeah. which is awesome <laughs> i love it it's it is beautiful i mean i've i've had the sensation several times out in salt lake city like Oh, I can see why Mormon settlers came here and was like, this is the land of God. <laughs> I mean, I'd look around and I, I get that same feeling. I'm like, I wasn't, get it. Um, wasn't the story like uh, there's a section of the Bible where Jesus just like disappears for four years or five years or something like that. And then he comes back and he like knows how to build shit. And the Mormons are like, yeah, he came to like Utah and just walked around a bunch when like clearly he just went to carpentry school in Israel. <laughs> it's like clear. you decide <laughs> yeah it's like, i mean i don't know i'm not a fucking religion professional or anything but it sounds, <laughs> sounds legit <laughs> yeah, totally um yeah well cool man i really appreciate you coming on it is always a pleasure being here uh in your studio bill and thanks for having me and thank you for anyone uh, who listened um and uh follows bill's music uh, we are birds of feather I'm really glad that there's so many people out there that uh, have an appreciation for sound design and music on the level that uh, even the, though we the, didn't the talk you, about you that. aspire to. But that's the thing. I don't think like this is even useful, like a useful platform to talk about that shit because YouTube is such a useful platform for that. So. Yeah, it's really hard to like talk about making music yeah, in terms well. of like, well, you see, I use this plugin through yeah. that one, and like talking about it is, you know, streaming is a good platform for that. Yeah, yeah, where you, you got to kind of show rather than than tell, but. You know, hopefully this this served as a good conduit for people to get kind of get in touch with with their uh, uh, you know producers that they that they like. I'm glad you're doing a podcast. You're 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 a good interviewer. Good uh, I should podcast. say conversationalist. Conversationalist, yeah. yeah. Fuck, fuck interviews. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Cheers. All right, cheers. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Bill podcast. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Bill podcast. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Bill podcast. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Bill podcast. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Bill podcast.